are watching Property TV. Hello and welcome to the fourth series of Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and joining me today are two people who have starred in our series three, now transferred over to series four, Hayley Andrews, uh, founder, CEO of Your Freedom Empire. Hello. Hello Hayley, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good, good trip good. down? Yeah, absolutely. Great no traffic stuff. at all. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> That's unusual. It is. Uh, John Howard, developer, investor, author and mentor. And of course, TV star from our previous series. How are you, John? I'm very well, thank you. I think I was in series one, two, and three. Do you? Okay. Well, it's more than I was. <laughs> oh, in that case, maybe two and two three and then. Three. And now four. <laughs> and now three. <laughs> now four. Okay. Well, we'll get on with some good questions, I hope. And um, I think we have a sort of semi political theme today, oh, so that'll ooh. suit you well. <laughs> I warmed up. But anyway. Will John be falling out again today, will we? It might yeah. be. <laughs> anyway, look, Hayley, we're going to start with you. Um, latest stats suggest that c the COVID-driven migration from some of the big cities has now ceased. Manchester and London are reporting especially younger people returning to the city living. However, a significant difference in behaviour is being noted in Birmingham, where the migration trend continues. What do the panel think is driving these trends and what effect will it have on the property market? Well, that's just made for you, isn't it? <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Miss, Miss Birmingham? Right. Yeah. Um, so you're absolutely right. There has been a different trend to other cities such as Manchester, uh, London. Um, so I, I looked into this <laughs> deliberately. <laughs> Um, so I hope looking that's not into, just because we're going well, no. into questions early. No, no, right. no. So I, I, I always look at population. I look at areas where population is increasing. I always look at movement, um, you know, behaviour of people, everything. So that's something that I do on a regular basis anyway. So in looking into Birmingham, and of course we have seen in London and Manchester people, you know, out post-COVID, moving back, wanting mm. to be where the city, you know, where everything's happening basically, mm. back in the city centre. Um, so it was it was quite unusual to see, well, why hasn't that happened in Birmingham at the same level as it has there? Um, so in actual fact, looking at the statistics, and we're not talking huge percentage drop in population mm. or anything here, we're talking about 0.1%, um, which is still quite high, but um, historically Birmingham since the 1900s has seen population fall and rise throughout the years. So it's nothing that's it doesn't worry me if that's if that's okay. the, uh, the question. But the reason we're not seeing people move um, uh, or we're seeing people move away from Birmingham um, on a very small scale and people not commuting, moving back to Birmingham as a result of moving away through the COVID is because um, actually they didn't move far in the first place. Oh. So they moved out of the borough, so <clears throat> Birmingham borough, and they moved into neighbouring um, mm. towns and cities where they get much more for their money, more yeah. space, um, much more affordable, and there's no real compromise because a short commute back into Birmingham is 20, 30 minutes. Um, so they actually didn't move far. So that's why we're not seeing them return post-COVID because there's no real, it, there was so no the two real that went compromise. So come back now? Yeah. <laughs> um, the other interesting fact that I, uh, so I, I don't know whether you know, but Birmingham have really gone down the route of uh, attract, train and retain. That's their kind of model. So they're really looking at an education hub, you know, new starter businesses. Yeah. That's what they're focusing on as, as a city. And I think that's great. You know, we've got major universities, several leading universities. You've got many of the colleges now with university status. And I think one of the reasons we saw the population drop as well was because a lot of students, of course, the universities was closed, etc. Mm. So this, you know, small drop, mm. I think we will see a correction in that. But the people that were moving away were your older, middle 
age um, and yeah, upper. What, like, yeah, they want a, a bit of garden. A, a yeah, house. so that was another trend that we saw. Mm. They were moving, you know, further away mm. into neighbouring towns and and cities such as Wolverhampton, etc. Still twenty minutes on the train to Birmingham, uh, trains every fifteen minutes. Yeah. There's, you know, the yeah. transport links are all there. All um, so there was no compromise, and they got more for their money and still the city life. Um, and uh, with Birmingham, we're seeing 16 to 21 year olds increase. Mm. So I, I think I think Birmingham, well, it, it's always been known as the city of uh, a, a thousand and one trades. It's always been known for its diversity. It's one of the reasons I love it. And it's always been able to adapt and change with the times. And I think that's why it's mm. always been mm. such a great performing um, city. Okay. And what's it like in Ipswich? Well, can I just? Well, it's it's very good in Ipswich, thank you. But what I would say, um, it's all down to Andy Street, who's the who, who's the Conservative mayor, of course, over the last five years. He's driven the city forward. Um, I'm not sure Birmingham City Council are that clever, but certainly as um, the government created the, these mayoral roles across the UK, and that's a great example. Andy Street is a, a great example of a very good mayor who's got back in and who's driving the city forward. And it's got one of the youngest populations yeah. um, growth in the next five years. And I know these some of the facts that um, Haley's come up with because of course we invest quite heavily at the moment in Birmingham, second biggest city. Yeah. It's got awful lot going for it. Um, it really has. And, and so have the, like you said, the areas around Birmingham, you know, the towns and cities around Birmingham. It's a very diverse, exciting environment to, to, to work in. I would say it's one of the one of the most diverse cities and most improved. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I think in London, I think it's just the the, the capital city aspect, isn't it? Oh. You know, there's yeah. there's a, there's a need to be in the capital city for certain businesses, and it will always pull it will the people, always, it will pull always people back. Right. Won't there's it? always a natural trend with city centres. Anyway, it doesn't matter whether it's London, Birmingham, mm. uh, or Manchester, or anywhere mm. else. Um, if the prices get to a certain uh, you know, yep. it's not affordable no. anymore, then you move to the next postcode. Yeah. And there's a ripple effect that happens. Absolutely. And I think that yeah. has happened. Yeah. People are still using Birmingham. People are still living in Birmingham. Mm. It's just attracting a younger audience. Yes. And the older 35 plus are moving out yeah. um, uh, to your, your neighbouring mm. towns. And sense. their populations have grown. That's how we can see, you exactly. know, what's happened with statistics. So it's, it's not bad news at all. Good. OK, well, on that happy note, John, your question. <laughs> yes, let's hope it remains happy. Um, and, and talking of happiness, um, with the dismal forecast issued by the Bank of e England recently, mm -hmm. predicting 10% plus inflation yep. rates and effectively a recession for the next two years at least, what effect do the experts think all this will have on the housing market? OK, let me give you one stat first, if I may. Um, which stock market has performed best in the world so far this year? You tell me, John. The FTSE has. Right, okay. right? That's the first thing. So we're doing a lot, lot better than most other countries, if not every country in the world, just about. So let's put it in perspective. It's a worldwide problem. I was with a, um, an MP a while ago who said, there's no way, John, we can control inflation because it's a worldwide problem. We can't control energy prices because it's a worldwide problem. So it's very difficult to see how you get out of this quickly. And a lot of people are now saying that putting interest rates up actually just makes it worse. It doesn't actually help. Now, I'm not an economist, but they're now admitting to 10% inflation. We all know it's double that at least, because if you go shopping, which I'm sure even you do a little bit of food shopping on occasions, you will notice, I can't believe I'm saying this, but anyway, you will notice that the cost of food has gone through the roof. It has, yeah. And, 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 and as well as um, gas, electric, petrol, and all the rest of it. It's a lot more than 10% on things that you buy every day of the week. That is a major, major problem for any government in the world. And it's very difficult to see how we get out of it. But what do you not, was the original do, question? Do you not think, John, <laughs> you, you're starting to sound a bit like Boris in a way, because, you know, the, the other day he said, oh, we're the best performing uh, yeah, country in the G7. We are. We and yet the be... bank said, we're the worst performing no, listen, uh, in, we need in to be the proud. G7. We need to be, this country, people in this country need to appreciate 
how how good the economy we do has need been to, we do in need the to past be proud and, and how good and it's going to be in the future. We need to be proud and self-supporting, but we don't need to be burying our heads in the sand. I don't We're think not accepting what's I don't wrong. Think anybody's burying their head in the sand, but you do have to appreciate that it's a worldwide problem. And actually, we're doing better than most countries. Well, if not every I, country. I'm not. I'm not sure. I that's want to be right. in Europe and, at the moment. Would you? And 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 again, I, I I see the pundits on TV sort of say that. Um, right across Europe, the governments are doing a lot more to help people through yeah, these because they've times. had to, because their situation is worse than ours. Far worse. Right. Would you want to be in Europe at the moment? <laughs> I would. I don't know. Hey, I Lee, would. What, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I think the people it's hitting most, of course, is those that were already on the breadline, and we're seeing it across our portfolio and people, uh, you know, struggling, and even staff asking for pay rises as well. Of course, inflation is still outstripping it's a pay rises. Circle. It's a vicious it's, circle, isn't it? But of course, as a business, you're affected by inflation as well. Mm. It's always, you know, it affects everyone, not just your tenants or not just your employees. No, but interesting, Hayley, in the past, no property person has done too bad out of inflation no in the past it's 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 actually done well, well, pretty well well for, prop for property yeah you, you but, is for inflation, case, but, you? but is that going to be the case but is that going to be the case this time I, I i personally don't think so the agents are telling us that the that the market's really going off now um i, I think everybody sort of thought we'd hit the ground running at the beginning of the year yeah, we did. It, was it was always predicted that it would mm. though yeah it, it had to it had to slow down it had to it's stop. cyclical isn't it yeah. it, it comes down to affordability mm. lending capability Absolutely. and 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 of course if the lending and isn't available and confidence, confidence mm. it, it, you're definitely seeing a slowdown i think well um, we'll, but, we'll rely on john for the confidence can i, show can, I, I yeah, he's can, got I ask, can i ask you uh, to ask me a question please am i a better developer this year investor developer this year than i was last year you tell me john no i'm not any better probably but uh, but i'm i've been offered and i'm buying a lot more deals this year than i was last year so that tells me that the market is softening you know, there's more problems out there. We're getting many, many more opportunities. Now, you can jump too soon with all this. Mm -hmm. You know, you can end yeah. up buying a load of stuff and then a year later think, oh, I was, I was too keen. You know, I should have waited another year. But we'll see. Well, John, you've been doing this long enough to know that, you know, where there's a problem, there's a profit. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, Absolutely. that's how I'm you rubbing, make a lot you know, of your money. You a bit know? of blood on your hands, a bit, of, bit of blood in the streets. It, if it's not a problem, you, you don't, don't buy it. it's not a problem. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. OK, well, that's all we've got time for in this half of the show. So join me again with Hayley and John after the break. You are watching Property TV. You are watching Property TV. Hello and welcome back to part two of Property Question Time with Hayley Andrews and John Howard. Um, Hayley, your second question. Rental rates are reported to be rising across the country, contributing to the higher cost of living we're all experiencing. The government has announced that it wants to reintroduce the Right to Buy programme, first introduced in the 80s. Do the panel think this will uh, be widely taken up and subsequently have an effect on the buy to let business model? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Great question. Um, so they actually piloted this um, in 2015 in the Midlands and it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is because um, there, were, there wasn't enough land, affordable land. And then the pressure to replace every property that was sold um, at such discounted, the, 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 the money raised from the sale didn't cover could rebuilding. build a new one. No. Exactly. So it was an unsustainable business model, basically. So what's going to be different this time? I, well, that's what I'd like to know. Have they changed anything? So, I mean, I come from a council estate. My mum purchased her council home under the right to buy. She and, likes and to probably, them, she? Yes, she does. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think she was awesome. You know, <coughs> Margaret Thatcher, that is. <laughs> um, my mum, too. But, well, there's a, well, on, on okay. Margaret Thatcher, I mean, I, I mean, she did do a lot for the housing market. Huge she, she had brought in a short, short hold tenancies, she did. Yep. which, which allowed the, the current uh, um, space to buy to let owners really because yeah, you'd never let your that's property the... out before because you'd end up with a sitting tenant. Exactly. And, and that's if they're what... not careful that's what we're going to go back to. Absolutely yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I, I think there's pros and cons to the scheme and I, I'd be interested and I can't say I've 
I've read what, what the proposal is this time or whether it's any different, any different to the last no, time. No. I'm not sure. I'm not I know it didn't sure work in 2015. <laughs> um, and those are the reasons why. But not only that, it also puts massive pressure on local authority housing um, lists. You've got something like 3.6 million people um, on those lists. That equates to something like 1.1, no, sorry, 1.6 six or seven, don't quote me on that, but around 1.6 or 7 million households. Some of those people have been on that list for 10 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and not only that, while it seems great, actually you've got um, you know emergency accommodation and short-term accommodation yeah. has risen massively <coughs> um, as a result of not having the homes that have been sold off to uh, house these <coughs> individuals. I also think that while it's trying, uh, while the idea is nice, and I understand where they're coming from with it, and of course, as I said, my mom purchased her council house. You know, I came from a council estate, so I see the positives behind it. But you also see people that are trapped in a mortgage; they can't sell the property. Um, and the property falls into disrepair. It's not only about the mortgage, you have to maintain that property as well. And that costs money. And quite often what you see is the, you know, they've, they've got an asset on paper, but in reality, they're living in a property that's not fit for purpose any longer. Well, I think two, two things there, Hayley. One is that if we go back to the Margaret Thatcher time, uh, when all these properties were sold, I think there was a stat that said, I think it was about 75% of those properties now are in the hands of buy-to-let owners. So actually, they didn't do an awful um, lot for, um, the, for the housing ownership. No, it's absolutely true. I mean, really? if you look at the council estates, mm. especially in some of the areas, you know, mm. around the areas that I invest as well, what many people did, I think there was a restriction on how long you had to live mm. there What's after you years? purchased. Yeah. As soon as they hit that five years, they sold it, cashed in and went somewhere else. And they sold them to investors. Yeah. And they were able to sell them to investors because they didn't pay. They got something like 70 percent off. Was yeah. it something like up, that? Up to that. But, up but, to 70 yeah. percent. But I, I think, to be honest with you, you're being a bit. I mean, I'm not sure we're going to agree on too much there, Hayley. Because I, th I, I hear what That's you say. That's OK. We I, can disagree. I, know we can. <laughs> I hear what you say. And, and some of what you said I would agree with. However, it was a wonderful opportunity that the, the uh, Margaret Thatcher Conservative Government at the time gave people a fantastic opportunity to buy their own home who would never otherwise have done so. One of the reasons they did it, as always, because they know that if they, you know, if you own your own home, you're more likely to vote Tory than you are Labour and that, and, or, or Liberals. And that's just a fact of life. And what they're really worried about now at the moment is the fact that um, in the 1980s, 50% of people under the age of between 25 and 35 own their own home, 50%. That now is 29%. And what they're worried about with an election coming up in two years' time, these people are not you know, not able to buy anymore. But John, and that's a big problem. But John, you know, it's not going to be the young people that buy under un, under right to buy because it's going to no, be, it's going to be longer I, term I, tenants. I, under, I understand but, that. But I mean, the real, the real point about this this is I, th I think Haley just sort of stumbled across one of the issues is I don't think this government's really worked out how they're going to do it and what the restrictions are the, these are ju to me it just seems like they're, they're headline grabbing well, yeah. and know. that's always what it's about isn't it you have to look at the detail behind the headline yeah. and and also it's a huge burden to tax well, well this not is burden the... but it's a huge cost to taxpayers yes but if you don't get enough for the property exactly and, and the money you... doesn't go back to the councils are going to build more then, but, then but, but, it's but not sustainable still... no. can i stop you there the whole this government is the first tory government that's allowed councils to build council houses they have allowed them and the home, home but they're England... not business people and they're not building well, them that's... at a that's not, the, that's not the government's fault. The Homes England, which is the government bank, have got billions of pounds available to lend to councils and to housing associations to build houses. But they need costs... to get off their backsides and build more. But if it costs a hundred, yeah, but they can't because of the lack of land, affordable land, and then obviously the development cost selling at seventy percent discount or up to seventy percent discount, they can't build them. They wouldn't money. be having any money out of those people if they didn't, if they don't cash them in. They'd have nothing because think, they're nothing forever. So 
50%, 30%, 80% is better I looked than nothing. At it, that money can uh, uh, go into new build. I'm afraid I think the simple problem is that we, that we run our politics and our, our decisions on a four-year cycle. Of course we do. And I'm afraid, unless you put in, in, in into action a longer-term strategy that's, in Haley's words, sustainable, oh, then nothing's going to work. It will be short-lived. Yeah, get the votes short-term. Oh, we'll, we'll be on the, our... the uptake actually wasn't that massive anyway. I think you'll find the uptake was pretty good. And can I just say, the government have been in power 10 years, so is the 10-year plan not a, not a five-year four... And, and we'll be in for another five years, in my view. The, the, the way you've got to look at it as well is the up to 70% discount on average equates to 15 years worth of rent. Mm. It might do, but my point is that the capital value they're getting back, whatever it might be, is more than they'd have if they carried on if they carried on renting it. So that well, that bit to 30, the individual, yes, yeah, to I the, see the benefit no, there. To the council, if it's thirty percent or fifty percent or eighty percent, they're getting back on the value. They can reinvest that money in new build, and that's what it's about. How, but that's how, still how, taxpayers' if you, if you get, money. If you get thirty or forty percent of the value of a property back, how do you invest then in hundred percent in a new build? That, well, because they're funding through Homes England and all these other grants. That's why they, that's what they're doing. Mm. That's what they're doing. Not, what happens, not convinced. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're the no, facts. I you might not be it. convinced or not, Steve, but they, they are the facts. I can't see it as, facts. A, as sustainable. There's pros and cons around it, but I think the, the way they do it really needs to be looked at. Otherwise, we'll just be saying we've piloted it again, as we did back in 2015 in, and, diff and in the work. Midlands. It doesn't work because. So no. there's got to, they've got to address those issues in order. I think it's a great idea, but it needs to work. Well, we agree right. then. It's a great idea. Come on then. Come on then, Boris. Let's have your next question. <laughs> <laughs> right. OK. Do the panel Don't think... Don't you have a party to go to? <laughs> <laughs> Not too late. <laughs> might be a better use of time. <laughs> anyway. Um, do the panel think that the onerous surcharge in possessions, uh, uh, in positions that the government is planning to inflict on developers, re-safety instructions, will simply be passed on and cause an increase in the cost of construction? So... If so, what would the panel do differently to rectify the billions of pounds worth of unsafe elements of completed buildings? I know, John, you've had experience of this, and it's quite a serious subject. Um, and I, I've just never been sure where, where the liability lies. You've got local councils giving consent for buildings, checking the mm. building regulations, yeah. issuing the instructions. Mm. Developer does what he's told. He mm. builds to that standard. Yeah. People buy in good faith. So I'm not sure where the liability lands. Well, I think there's two, two distinct um, issues here. So let's break them down. One is the properties that weren't, weren't, weren't built correctly uh, and have got fire issues and all cladding issues and so on. Those ones need to be dealt totally differently. Um, and any developer that's built them wrong um, and not got caught out, if you like, should be put in them right completely and so on. And there are some of those, but, but there aren't that many of them. So that's the first thing. So any developer that's done it wrong, fraudulently, must put it right, end of. And then you've got the other people, the other developers who've done it everything correctly. Um, it's just that the building regulations have changed over the years and now, now the government has said, well, you know, they're not up to regulation standard now. Well, that isn't the developer's problem of 10, 15 years ago. And one way or the other, they, they, those blocks need to be dealt with. But to put the more burden on, uh, Mike, which Michael Gove is trying to do, put more burden on the developers to pay even more money. I mean, some of these, some of these big developers, house builders, have paid out 500 million, a billion pounds already. Or they're, going, they're going back 30 years. On this, it's madness. Mm. And that is wrong. That mm. is wrong. Mm. Um, now, I came up with a suggestion to, I was asked by um, our MP actually, who, because we had a few problems in Ipswich, and I was asked uh, uh, by Tom Hunt, our MP, what, what uh, you know, could you help me with a solution? And my solution is that every freehold block um, can borrow the money to do these blocks. They can borrow the money to repair the blocks. A lot of them have just got, need fire breaks at every level. Not all, not some of need all the cladding done, but many are just need fire breaks and so on. That's still expensive because of the because of the scaffolding. Now, that block could borrow the money over thirty years, and it could add a small amount to the service charge, 
on a quarterly basis for the 30 years and get it all paid off. That way, nobody's responsible for 30, 40,000 a, a time straight away. They're only paying a small amount off the mortgage. And that mortgage is on the freehold, not on the leaseholder. So mm. then basically whoever then buys the flat knows you well as another, you know, 65 pounds a month that goes on to the loan. And that to me is the most sensible, easiest way of dealing with this apart from government grants, uh, which they have given out, of course, as well. The whole thing is, is wrong, in my view, and they should, I thought my idea was a very good idea. It didn't get very far, um, which I was disappointed about. So that's what I think. Now, on the other side is, you know, will developers just slap it on an, another development? They can't do, because at the end of the day, the market's gonna get tighter. Things are gonna get harder to sell. And the one telltale sign is when, when developers start to struggle, you'll see signs saying, we'll do a, a, a pod exchange available. As soon as anyone sees pod exchange available, you know the market's not as good as it was. And, and it's all like you saying, and I heard you say it many times, Steve, oh, well, the developer will just charge, you, charge them more. I don't think they can, because you've got valuations and everything else done You know when someone purchases. So I, I honestly think that, I, th I think for once, and I'm not saying, in the past that we haven't had it away but in the but at the moment i think the developer is 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 being unfairly treated okay on that note john we're going to have to finish that's all we've got time for so big thank you to hayley andrews thank you for coming down hayley right. and for john howard thank you john pleasure good advice always. and answers as ever i'm stephen gelpin join me again next time on property question time mm -hmm.